Thank you. Uh, coming after someone like Midge and some of the one like Arun and some of the other speakers is certainly a challenge. I'll see if I can do that without putting you all to sleep. Because I'm going to talk about economics, but I'm also going to talk about energy, the environment, risk and time, and in, in a little bit in the context of China and the developing world. And fundamentally, I'm going to admit one thing that you've heard a bit about today, but we haven't talked about, and that's population growth, because that's underneath a lot of what we say. In economics, I really want to talk about two things. One deals with um, the kind of uh, regular economics you hear about, that you hear in the news. Um, but what I'm going to spend the time on is what I do. I'm an environmental economist, resource economist, energy economist. The kinds of goods we deal with aren't the things you buy in the supermarkets. It's the kind of things that get produced for everyone, but are not paid for by everyone, but are used by everyone. I want to talk about energy and both renewables and non-renewables, but I'm going to talk mostly about the non-renewables because I think that's the problem we have. We want to move towards renewables, we want to move towards sustainability, but that's not where the world is today. And it's not where the world's going to be in the next quarter century, I'm afraid to say. That implies significant issues for the environment, which we need to talk about. And dealing with those issues is how we deal with risk management over space and time. How do we make these hard decisions that are going to cost us money, but are going to provide some idea of where the future is going? That has to be done in the context of China and the developing countries. And the numbers I'm going to show you, and what I'm going to talk about, I hope will make that clear. Whoops, better make sure this goes. Everyone's been exposed to economics, monetary, physical policy, supply, demand, prices, exchange rates, you know the names. But what we talked about here is the private goods. What I want to talk about, as I said, is the public goods or public bads with the issue that these are produced. Once produced, they're consumed by everyone. There's no prices, so there's no easy way to understand how much of these should be produced and how much should not. Obviously, in private goods, we know it's based on what the consumer wants, it's what they're willing to pay. But on, oops, I'm going to do something good. Try this again. Public goods, there's no prices, as I said, to tell producers and consumers what to do. But the value of a single unit of a public good is not what you would be willing to pay, but what all of us collectively would be willing to pay. But the cost is still borne by the producer of that good or that bad or however it's done. So that makes for different rules. Public goods provide value, like national defense. Public bads can impose costs. The pollution that we talk about in global warming is probably the most extreme example or pure example of a public good that I can think of. And the nexus between energy and the environment that we worry about today is driven by public bads. Energy is a huge area. It's keeping up is hard. If anyone that tries to keep up with everything going on in energy today soon finds it's a very difficult task. But I want to talk about what we think will happen over the next quarter century. And I'm going to do that by the latest information that's coming out of the World Energy Outlook from the Inter uh, International Energy Agency. If you look at this, what we see here is the growth in primary energy. What it says is that basically the amount of energy we use is going to grow by about a third in the next quarter of a century, the next 25 years. And over 50% of that growth is going to come from India and China. And if you look at us in the developing world, the OECD countries, that's probably on the order of 5% of that growth over the next quarter century. We may be important, we're going to stay important, but in the, in the future we're going to become much less of the issue and much more of the things that need to be done will come from the developing world. Let me, let's take a look at where that energy demand will come from. If you look at this today, what we see is oil will continue to be big, coal will be big, gas will be big, renewables are growing, and nuclear is also growing by a little bit. What we see is the growth is coming in gas and renewables, but they still will not reach the level of oil or coal in the next quarter century. One of the ways to look at what energy is needed is to take a look at vehicles. That's one of the primary uh, uh, determinants of demand, and it's also highly correlated with other energy use. What we see is if you look at the EU, the US, we're fairly stable. We're going to grow a little bit, not much. Look at China and look at India. And the growth rates in those countries, and these are vehicles per thousand. So these aren't the vehicles per country, vehicles per thousand of population. You realize that if you look at China, 
who has basically close to four times our population. There's going to be more vehicles in China in 25 years than there are in the U.S. What about does that mean for imports of oil? Well, if you look at it today, 2000, even 2010, China's been growing. Look what happens by 2035, based on our current projections. We're going to see, actually, we anticipate a reduction in imports in the U.S., fundamentally because of new discoveries and increased ener energy efficiency. Where does that growth in energy going to come from? If you look at it over the next 25 years, it is projected that still virtually half of that energy growth is going to come from coal. And coal has by far the largest environmental footprint of any of the energies that we use. If you look at the others, the next greatest chunk is going to come from natural gas, the next greatest chunk is going to come from coal, oil, and a much smaller portion of the total comes from renewables. And yet, what does that cost us? If you want to look at the uh, share of new power generation and look at it, what the investment to produce that is, yes, coal will produce a significant amount, about a little over 35% of the coal of the power generation growth. But if you look at the cost of that compared to wind, solar, hydro, it's about the same for a much, probably three to five times amount of generating capacity. So we have huge challenges as we move towards a renewable, sustainable future. What does this mean on the environment? This means carbon dioxide emissions will continue to grow. This means that the climate change that we've been talking about is probably going to continue. And all the scenarios we've been looking at maybe understate what is actually going to happen. Again, let's look at the IEA projections. One of the things that we've talked about, and you can look at in the graphs I've talked about in energy, is pretty similar to the carbon dioxide gas. But one of the things that we've talked about and China has used to beat us over the head a bit is that, yes, we may be doing a lot now, but you guys have been doing it for the last century, and the net impact of the U.S. and the OECD is far greater than China. And that is true today. Look what happens in 25 years. By 25 years, the cumulative, cumulative CO2 Emissions from China will exceed that of the OECD and will be closing in on the U.S. If you look at what that means for our trajectories on climate change, we had been hoping against hope, and three or five years ago, most of us working in this area would have believed by now we would have a, some kind of a carbon policy or some kind of dealing with CO2 emissions. That hasn't happened. And we may be back to the 6% or 6 degree centigrade temperature rise that is projected on this one. Okay. If you look at where that comes from, most of that comes from CO2. This is a picture from the World Resource Institute. So what are the implications? There's growing evidence that continued growth in conventional energy use and associated emissions will reduce the risk associated with climate change. In space, that means it's going to happen worldwide. No country can deal with this problem in isolation or by themselves. In temporal context, it matters when does this happen? When does it matter? The sooner we act, the sooner things happen, the less the total impact will be. What I've said is developing countries like China and India are the largest drivers of increased emissions. Developing countries tend to be significant sources, but that any option we suggest must include everybody. There's lots of technical solutions. We can increase renewables. That's expensive. We still need to learn a lot to do that better. We can use something called carbon capture utilization and storage. You heard Arun talk about that. You can use that to store it, or you can use it to get more oil through enhanced oil recovery. Either way, we take some of the CO2 out of the atmosphere. From an economist's perspective, we need to worry about markets. Private markets produce powerful forces. One of the things that happens is the energy use and emissions, particularly, are not currently driven by environmental factors not driven by the environmental factors, because there's no real price signals that come in to tell companies how to do this. Um, so a price on emissions would help. As, a, as an economist, I actually think that that's what it's going to take, because what I want to do is to turn this problem over to the private sector. If you let them have price signals to do it, I think you would be amazed at the amount of technological innovation and change that would occur. And the other thing that I want to talk about is solutions must include China and developing countries. So in summary, 
Current energy tr uh, trends lead to an uncertain future, and the risks are really high. I don't think we really know what those projections will be or what bad things or uncertain things will happen. The developing world must be included. And on the other thing and final thing, I think that in my work in China, that China is preparing to take the lead through investments in technology as well as market power in the world as we see it in the future. Thank you. Thank you.